So the tensions are increasing. The war is expanding. And there is a threat that it could expand further. Although I personally, and I could be wrong, I personally do not believe that the United States will attack Iran because it, it would be a war that it cannot win and it would also destroy the global economy. Welcome to the GIST on Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadharan. I'm privileged to have as my guest on the GIST, uh, Dr. Sayed Mohammad Marandi. Uh, he is a professor uh, teaching English literature and Orientalism at Tehran University. And he's also a commentator on regional issues, including on foreign policy, which is why we've been able to we've been able to get access to him. And Dr. Marandi, glad to have you on our show. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Dr. Marandi, let's get straight to the point. Um, the Gulf seems very unstable. Tensions are rising. There have been attacks on U.S. targets there. Uh, is it your sense that uh, the region is uh, very close to war? At the moment, the Persian Gulf itself is quiet. Of course, Iraq and, um, and uh, other countries in the Persian Gulf uh, are all host to U.S. bases, except for Iran, of course. And uh, in the case of Iran, uh, uh, the uh, country has uh, no foreign bases because according to the Constitution, such a thing is not uh, possible. But in Iraq, Parliament has voted or voted four years ago to remove all U.S. bases, but the United States has refused to leave. And what they do is that they take uh, the money that Iraq receives from its oil sales, keep it in a U.S. bank account, and they spoon feed the Iraqis. And whenever the Iraqis want to conf let's say, reaffirm their independence or whenever the Iraqis want to uh, show resolve about their sovereignty, the United States withholds the, uh, the budget or the money that they need for their budget. So U.S. forces continue to remain in Iraq and overwhelmingly Iraqis are opposed. And this causes natural tensions. This causes anger and this causes resistance. The same is true in Syria. The US occupies roughly one third of Syria and it cooperates with ISIS in the Al Tanf area, which recently we saw three American soldiers killed. Uh, that is where a large number of uh, tribes that were affiliated with ISIS reside and the Americans train them, support them. Then they carry out attacks on the Syrian army and go back to their bases. And of course, no Americans are ever killed. So in, in Syria too, like in Iraq, people are completely opposed to the US occupation and there is resistance, like there would be resistance everywhere else, like there was resistance in your country during the English uh, colonial period. But what happened was that the genocide in Gaza, the ongoing genocide, has increased tensions across the region. In Yemen, we saw that Ansarullah has imposed a siege on Israeli ports until the genocide ends. And uh, the United States then went and increased tensions in Yemen by striking uh, Yemeni, killing Yemeni sail, sailors, even though they had not killed anyone. And then they fired many missiles into Yemen and thus uh, Yemen increased the scope of their targets to include British and American ships as well. 
So these tensions are increasing. And Iraq and Syria are also impacted by the fact that the United States, which is occupying their countries illegally, is also aiding and supporting the Israeli regime in this genocide. At the same, simultaneously, we have American airstrikes in Iraq, where they killed a number of military officials. We also see the Israelis targeting Lebanon and uh, carrying out terrorist attacks in Beirut against Hamas officials, or in Damascus, uh, illegal airstrikes which kill Syrians and an Iranian general. So the tensions are increasing. The war is expanding, and there is a threat that it could expand further. Although I personally, and I could be wrong, I personally do not believe that the United States will attack Iran because it, it would be a war that it cannot win, and it would also destroy the global economy. So if um, the U.S., yes, bears a share of the blame, no doubt about that. What about Iran, your support for armed proxies like the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, also Hamas? Are you not to blame also? No, because uh, first of all, these are not proxies. In Yemen, the Saudis and the Emiratis, along with the Americans, the Canadians, the British, the German, the French, they carried out a, genes a decade of genocide. They imposed a, 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 a hunger siege on Yemen by blocking the ports, and they provided the Saudis with all the weapons that they needed to bomb the country day and night. They bombed schools, they bombed uh, school buses, funerals, hospitals, just like what the Israelis are doing now. But they failed. And Yemen was able to preserve its sovereignty and Ansarullah, or what the West likes to call the Houthis, they remained in power in San'a. Why? Because they had popular support. Otherwise, uh, Iranian funding compared to the financial uh, power of all these countries in the Western bloc combined, along with the Saudis and Emiratis, is of course much smaller. So Iran was supporting the people who were being uh, massacred, the people who were the victims of genocide. And they have their own agency. If they were just proxies, there was no way that they could have won this decade-long war. Or in the case of Iraq and Syria, Iran supported the government in Syria. And Iran, and with it, Iran's presence in Syria is because of the request of the Syrian government. And in the case of Iraq, Iran's presence and support for the creation of the popular mobilization forces took place at the request of the Iraqi government when ISIS was advancing on Baghdad. We have to keep in mind that the West, contrary to the belief of many, the West created Al-Qaeda and ISIS. This is something that they manufactured. in. Syria on September the 12th, 2012, Jake Sullivan, who is now the national security advisor of the U.S. president, wrote in an email to Hillary Clinton, who was then the secretary of state, that in Syria, Al-Qaeda is on our side. This is online. Anyone can search and find it. But back then, ISIS was a part of Al-Qaeda. Then ISIS split away because of internal differences. And then we had the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012, which was published. This is also online. This is a, the world's largest uh, military uh, agent, uh, intelligence agency in the world, affiliated to the Pentagon, a part of the Pentagon. In this document, the United States says that its regional allies want to create a Salafist entity between Iraq and Syria to isolate Syria and to put pressure on the relationship between these countries, but basically to overthrow Syria. And then later in an interview on Al Jazeera with a reporter called Mehdi Hassan, 
The head of the Defense Intelligence Agency at that time, General Michael Flynn, who briefly became the National Security Advisor during the first days of Trump's presidency, he said that the United States took a the United States took a willful decision to support this. So who was this Salafist entity? It was ISIS. They occupied the area between Syria and Iraq. So the West supported ISIS and Al Qaeda. They still do because the United States, as I said, in Al Tanf is assisting ISIS, and in Idlib in the north of Syria, NATO is supporting Al Qaeda and ISIS affiliates. And during this civil war, or the dirty war to be more precise, because it was a dirty war imposed by the West where they use ISIS and Al Qaeda and other such groups. During the dirty war in Syria, alongside the Golan, where the, the heights which belong to Syria, which Israel occupies, there were both ISIS bases and Al Qaeda bases. And the Israelis supported both against the Syrian army. Whenever the Syrian army would try to advance, the Israelis would bomb them or use helicopter gunships or use artillery. And they would also treat the injured uh, terrorists in their hospitals. So there's a long standing relationship between these extremist groups and the West. And I consider Israel to be the West. Uh, and Iran sent troops to Syria and advisors to Iraq to defeat ISIS. And the general who led the war against ISIS, General uh, Soleimani, General Qasem Soleimani, he was murdered by the Americans. So uh, Iran's support for these groups uh, is, is, a, is a misleading term because in Yemen, it's the government. In Syria, it's the government. And in Iraq, the Popular Mobilization Forces is a part of the Iraqi Armed Forces. In the case of Lebanon, Hezbollah is recognized by the government. It has members of parliament. It has members in the government, uh, in the cabinet. And uh, the government recognizes the resistance. In fact, Hezbollah was created as a result of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. It was a national resistance organization. And it ultimately kicked out the Israelis in the year 2000. So none of these are proxies. They all have agency and they are all, are all respected and supported in their home countries. And I would like to add that people in India should recognize that these extremist groups that many in India antagonize so much, these are groups created by the West and its entities like Iran, like Iraq, like Syria, like Hezbollah that fought these groups and defeated them. So what does Iran want in the region? Obviously, you want to see the Americans out, but uh, what is it that you want to achieve there? Well, since these are not proxies, and they are allies, and they have agency, what unites them, whether it's Hezbollah or Hamas or Ansarullah or the Syrian government or the Iraqi government or Islamic Jihad is an anti-imperialistic and anti-colonialist worldview. What they want is for the United States to end its despotic, hegemony over the region, and to end apartheid in Palestine, to end ethno-supremacism in Palestine. It's actually quite simple. Uh, simple. The West likes to make it look very complicated, but it's not. Iran's position on Palestine is identical to its position on apartheid South Africa. In in, in after the revolution, Iran broke off ties with both, both with Israel and with South Africa. Palestine should be inclusive. It should include Jews, Christians, Muslims, whoever, but as equal human beings. That is the issue. So the notion that Iran wants to drive the Jews into the sea or Iran wants to destroy the Jews, that's 
nonsense propaganda that is created by the very same people who are actually carrying out genocide in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So uh, Iran does not want the Jewish state to be dismantled. Is that what you're saying? Are you saying it should be more inclusive, a secular state? Iran wants the ethnocentric state to be dismantled. It's not a Jewish, Muslim, Christian state. It is a state where the Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all equal, both in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, but also in inside the 1967 borders. And people should have, must have the right to return. Those people, who, those millions of people, which I'm sure you know of in Lebanon and in Syria and in uh, Jordan and then elsewhere that live in refugee camps or in exile in general. All of them have a right to go home. And without a doubt, if the Jewish population of the whole of Palestine were to accept this, it would benefit them. This state of affairs is not sustainable. They may think it is sustainable. And I'm sure in South Africa, they thought it was sustainable, but it's not. So since you've mentioned India, uh, any more oil from you? Uh, Chabhar port has been kind of delayed. Um, I know our foreign minister was there recently, but uh, how do you see India, Iran? Iran and India uh, have had good ties in the past. Both were key members of the non-aligned movement. And uh, uh, Iran and uh, India's leadership in the global south has always been something that we would read about when I was young in Iranian journals before the age of the internet, of course. And uh, there are there were always good relations. Today, the relationship is is good, but of course, it's the Americans that prevent the relationship from moving forward. The Americans have imposed their will upon the Indians and prevented them from purchasing Iranian oil. They prevented them from really investing in Iran. And uh, that has hurt India and it has hurt Iran. So the Americans are not working uh, to strengthen India. The Americans are preventing area India from being able to play a larger economic role in West Asia. And of course, because of the Indian-Russian relationship and the sheer amount of oil and energy that India purchases from Russia, if that infrastructure had been completed right now, the economic situation in India would have been significantly better because India has problems exporting to Russia because of the limited infrastructure, which must go through Iran, the railways, the, so, the what is now being developed, the North-South Corridor that links Russia to the Persian Gulf through Iran. So the sanctions have slowed down the Iranian-Indian relationship, and the sanctions have caused India not to be able to benefit in the way it could under these circumstances where it's purchasing so much oil. Um, and therefore, I think people in India should recognize that the Americans are not doing Indians a favor, and that if the in Indians asserted their sovereignty uh, in a more significant way, they could benefit a great deal from closer economic ties with Iran. So I come to my last question. This is about Iran's internal situation. Uh, we've seen uh, we've seen reports, we've seen videos on the internet about uh, mass protests by women uh, on the hijab issue, and uh, how um, the Iranian authorities have treated those demonstrations, including firing on them. And we're not aware of how many casualties; probably very many. But uh, how do you explain the um, uh, policies of the um, Khamenei government, uh, President Riyasi's government? Uh, vis -a -vis its own people. Well, I think that's a very misleading picture, and I think Indians get receive a lot of their information from the West, and this is another problem that we have in the global South, and in, in, in particular between India and Iran, 
is that there is very little direct communication so that the Iranians can understand India directly without a third party. So in general, our understanding of India and what goes on in India is through the Western media. So the Western media says that India has a fanatical government. And so that's what most people hear. But if you speak to many Indians, they would disagree. But there is no strong media bond or intellectual bond or a large number of academics moving back and forth or a strong media presence, permanent media presence in Iran by media companies or and vice versa. So Indians, obviously, their information, like the Iranians, come from the West. It doesn't come direct for the most part. Those pre- protests that were and or riots that were a year and a half ago, the police were not shooting on the protesters. Over 60 police officers were killed during these riots because the riots, many of them had elements of armed people within them. And these armed people were terrorists that are trained, and I mean are trained, not were trained. They continue to be trained in northern Iraq and alongside the Pakistani border, inside Pakistan. They're, they've been funded by different governments in the past, depending on uh, politics. So in the past, the Saudis had a big role to play, for example, but now not so much. I don't know, maybe the Saudis don't have any role to play anymore. I'd have to ask. But now the Israelis and the Americans and uh, some European intelligence agencies, especially the British, they continue to fund these terrorist organizations. So they come in the country, they infiltrate society, they take advantage of protests, they turn them into riots, they make them violent, and people get killed. But if in the West you had 60 to 70 police officers killed, you could be sure that the reaction by the police in the West would be uh, very severe. But I should point out to your good viewers that I've been a professor at the University of Tehran, or an academic. I've been a professor for a few, few years, but I've been an academic at the University of Tehran for 20 years. And yes, 20 years. 18 of those 20 years, the dean of my faculty has been have been women for 18 of those 22 years. So my boss for most of my academic career has been one woman or another. The head of my department during this period has for quite a number of years been a woman too. So my immediate boss and the boss of my boss were women. Women in Iran are pilots, they're truck drivers, they're taxi drivers, and they are scientists. They are presidents of universities, they are members of parliament. There's a very misleading understanding of Iran that Western media presents just like it does with India. Iran is not a utopia, but it is definitely not a dystopia. There's more democracy in Iran, I would argue, than any of its neighbors, including Turkey. Is it an ideal democracy? Is it an ideal? No. But it is a country that has survived decades of maximum pressure sanctions designed to make people suffer and rise up against the government, terrorist organizations infiltrating, a huge Persian language media apparatus in the West. There are more anti-Iranian Persian channels than they're outside of Iran, beaming into the country, than there are inside Iran. So the West has been trying to undermine Iran for decades through these means, and it hasn't been able to succeed. And that is because Iran has a lot of popular legitimacy and the best evidence that I can provide is when the, when General Soleimani, who defeated the extremists, was murdered by the Americans. The funerals that the funeral that we saw in Tehran had over 10 million people. So 
I think that our friends in India should be careful about how uh, the United the West describes Iran, just like as Iran as Iranians should be more careful about how the West describes India. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they are not a part of our region. We are together in Asia, and we need to understand one another much better in order to improve the lives of our citizens. Excellent sentiment, Dr. Marundi. Uh, we are completely out of time. In fact, we have exceeded ours. But it was a very interesting conversation and a great insight into Iran and Iranian thinking. Uh, we should do this more often. Uh, Dr. Marundi, thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. Pleasure talking to you. That's all we have for you on this edition of The Gist. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on social media. Thank you very much. Good night.